Hello everyone, welcome to the Product Marketing Show. Today with me, I have Hayat Rachi from London. Hi Hayat, how are you doing? I'm doing great, how are you? I'm doing pretty good. So Hayat is a Product Marketing Manager at Tempo Software. Um, and in her last 10 years, she's been driving growth and success with multiple roles. Uh, so Hayat, um, let's start, let's get the ball rolling. Let's do it. Uh, before we jump in, uh, I'd like to make an announcement. So this show is sponsored by Content Beta. Content Beta is a full stack design service for B2B SaaS. Uh, more than 110 software companies use it to scale product marketing and customer enablement content. Uh, so Hath, let's start with your journey into this role. Can you give us a quick overview of how did you get into product marketing um, and what's your role at Tempo? Yeah, sure. Um, so I've had a bit of a wild ride professionally where in my early twenties, I decided to set up my own company and that was called, it was then called Neon Moon and it was a feminist and body positive lingerie and underwear brand for all women of all sizes. And it was the world's first brand that positioned themselves as feminist. So it was interesting to then learn from that company that I was the CEO and founder of for six and a half years that marketing played a role in producing cut through and producing customers at the end of the day and stealing the market share from competitors. So having that entrepreneurial flair in me, I, after I sold the company, I then became chief marketing officer for a Finnish company and they wanted me to expand their product offering within the UK. They were completely B2G, so government space orientated. So we were looking to get into the NHS, the like parliament and other governmental bodies. And mm -hmm. that was interesting to see, okay, let's build the team from the ground up. Let's see what marketing messages play out within the government space and create customers out of them. But also it was interesting to learn about the speed of which and the bureaucracy that comes along with actually signing up a governmental body. So I had both B2C and then B2G. And now my role uh, working for Roadmonk uh, by Tempo is B2B pure SaaS play. And I absolutely love my role now as a product marketing manager here, where it involves, you know, creating better positioning messaging making sure we're always geared around generating net new, but also customer adoption, uh, product adoption and customer retention, enabling the sales team to sell more and better and ensuring new features get good um, feedback and good adoption internally. So um, I've definitely niched down over the, over the years, but I absolutely love my role now. Lovely. I think being an entrepreneur for six years may, may, would have made you a natural storyteller. And, and I think product marketing is uh, all about telling story about your product, your features. So I think, I think yeah, it, it really gels well. Um, so uh, you mentioned about positioning. I want to go a deep, a bit deep into that. Um, a lot of, a lot of SaaS companies and probably the listeners are more around software and SaaS. Um, they refrain from going towards bold positioning. I mean, sometimes it becomes like a me too. Sometimes they try to create a category. What are your thoughts uh, around, uh, should, I, should I think about bold positioning or should I play it safe? Yeah, that's a great question. It's definitely a pattern that I've seen as well amongst SaaS companies where if you put many of their websites side by side, you probably can't tell which one's which because they all look the same. They have the same page layout. They have typically the same wording. You know, it's kind of like say goodbye to X, we are Y. It's just like, come on. So for me, using my B2C and B2B and B2G background, it was a case of, I believe, being bold is the way to create cut through. So, you know, in my own company, which I had, it was feminist, it was body positive, it was really being clear in what our messaging was. With the Finnish company React and Share, it was all about how to improve feedback. Feedback is like, you know, the bread and butter. It was like using very keywords to do so. So now in my current role at Tempo um, and with Roadmonk, for me, I'm, I need to bring that into play. And that's what I did. And that's what I'm currently doing because I felt like, and I mentioned it to the SL team members is, 
let's initiate a bit of a bolder, amped up messaging in order to create better traction for ads, for better traction for SEO, for new um, PPC campaigns. And for me, I've always seen an uptick in the bottom line being hit when bolder messaging is created. So instead of thinking, you know, in a B2B play, oh, we need to come across as professional, we need to play it safe, we need to not like, you know, rock the boat. For me, it's a case of actually, you're speaking to a person within an organization. There's absolutely no difference between B2C and B2B. And typically, B2C marketing campaigns are quite fun quite light, quite fun, quite bold. Bringing that same ethos into B2B has always worked for me. So for, I would for, definitely recommend for, that. For sure. I think a lot of people have told me that B2B stands from boring to boring. Um, <laughs> and, pro and probably marketers have made it boring to make sure we all look good, we all look professionals because, hey, that's a CEO, that's a CMO. How will they think? Right. Can you give me a couple of examples of bold positioning? Uh, probably from SaaS world and even from outside SaaS, uh, what have you seen and you love? Um, I don't think I can answer that one. I don't know. Oh, that's okay. Um, let's jump on. Uh, maybe let's jump on to uh, probably can you share something which you do at Roadmark? I mean, uh, where, how do you draw a line uh, on what is bold and what is not bold? Mm. Okay, so for me, when I joined Roadmark, I had a complete audit of what the messaging was and what the positioning was and the customer data that backed that up up until the point that I had joined. Then what I did was I created my own positioning and messaging report. Out of that report, it included customer surveys, customer calls and one to one conversations. And for me, it was taking what their pain point was and dialing it up in terms of the behavioral psychology and the feeling and the words that we used in our messaging. So instead of saying Roadmonk, uh, you can create a roadmap within 60 seconds, which is awesome. We have easy, you know, use uh, we're, we're the simplest tool to create a roadmap, right? Instead mm -hmm. of saying that, which is function based, which is what based for me, bold messaging comes out of the why, what does this actually do? So Roadmonk is the best way to impress your board members whenever you need to roadmap and show your roadmap. Mm. And for me, it's like using those pain points. If you want to impress, use Roadmonk. If you don't want to be kind of, yeah, if you want to stand out and make sure that you feel like you've done a good job, use Roadmonk. So it was like using and dialing up the feeling point and addressing the pain point that the actual user has instead of saying the function that it is. Interesting. And what kind of content and I mean, when, when let's say you decide on a positioning, right? Well, what kind of content should I focus on first in order to communicate that to my audience? So firstly, before content is created, definitely do the foundational research. So like I mentioned previously, speak to the customer, survey customers in bulk. And typically 10 responses are minimum to showing what the pattern is and what's required to act on from what the pattern has said. Then translating that into the positioning findings and clearly articulating it into messages that address the pain points of the customer and show how your tool is that solution to that pain point. Because the customer is typically always asking, so what? And that's the mm. question I ask myself whenever I create a new piece of content or creative around positioning. I'm asking, so what? Why does this matter to them? Does this matter to them? Does this resonate? Would this resonate to me? And I think if I put this piece of content alongside other competitors, would this stand out? And that's always the question I, I'm asking myself. Would it stand out? Does it address the so what question? If, if it does, like tick, tick, then you're on the right track. Interesting. And then let's say you've done the survey, you've done the research, and probably you come down to the, the positioning statement and you're uh, probably 
the hypothesis. Now, uh, how do you go about creating like creatives and content? I mean, do you uh, do you do it like is, is there a way to do it like step by step, or you want to change everything at once? Your social media, your website messaging. How, how should one go about? Yeah, that's a great question because some teams consider it a one-off project uh, as to other teams consider it an iterative process. I'm in the latter camp. I think of positioning and messaging as a consistent strategy that is a moving, breathing thing that doesn't stop once the project is done, right? Because Mm -hmm. competitors change. We need to keep up with them. The market is constantly changing. We need to keep an eyeball on them and seeing what the competitive intelligence is out there that can then be translated into content. But finally, and most importantly, the customer's needs change. They might be provided the solution in other means that maybe that you need to know. So when it comes down to the actual creation of the content, it's iterative. It's taking these small steps and help and hopefully have help from a growth marketer. Like I'm lucky I have a growth marketing team that I work alongside as a product marketer and we work on the iterative um improvements those one percent two percent weekly improvements that we can dial up so then it can lead to traction so whether the content is like you said social ads seo blogs or whatever it needs to have that moving breathing consistent change happening over time but fully informed as to what the research and the market and the customers are saying got it uh, let's try to zoom out a bit uh, for product marketing. Now, I mean, I've I've read a lot of playbooks, a lot of tactics on internet, on Twitter. According to you, what is the like an underrated strategy which people generally ignore? So, I would say the most underrated strategy that most people ignore is and. I'm going to sound like a a broken record, but speaking to the customer um, and they might think, how is that a strategy? But it informs you of everything. Like it removes all doubt. It removes all questions and guesswork and it bolsters your position when it comes to internal meetings and conversations that you're having uh, alongside product, alongside sales, alongside your other marketing team members, CS. When they ask you what's your priority and why are you working on improving the messaging on X as as opposed to Y? So, for example, why are you working on uh, battle cards instead of um, ads, for example? Then you have that underlying research that bolsters why you're strategically working on what you are. For me, I personally and everyone that I work with has known this over the years, I work smart and hard. It's a case of making sure that whatever I'm working on this week or this quarter has an impact and moves the needle this week, this quarter. We're not waiting a year in order to see those results. We need to be quick and we need to see those results instantly or as fast as possible. So strategically speaking to customers and being that voice of the customer internally is always going to play to your advantage as a product marketing manager. Um, but if I may ask, can you share your tech stack? I mean, a lot of people say different things, but really love to learn what's your daily tech stack looks like. Yeah, sure. So because I help sales out a lot in terms of sales enablement, I find myself in Salesforce and sales loft a lot in order to see, you know, our CRM, what's going on, what are the conversations that are being had and what are the qualifying information that the sales guys, um, and girls input into there. Then obviously use Slack because we all work remotely. We're a large, very large um, American firm and we all work uh, remotely. So I use Slack for that. And then full story amplitude in order to see how is it being adopted by customers. uh, And there I get my insights. And also Roadmonk, obviously that's our tools. I'm always in there actually testing out our features and making sure that I'm always up to date on how to um, use it and what new features are coming out. But, but yeah, the tech stack definitely aids, uh, my work in being super efficient, but nothing again can substitute for conversations with customers. So l- a link of both on a daily basis. Awesome. 
Awesome. Uh, one, one last question. Can you just share one of the incident? Probably could be a crazy high pressure situation in, in your office uh, where you would have implemented a product marketing tactic. Uh, probably even, even could even be non product marketing, like probably more marketing even in your past roles um, and where you've uh, come out victorious. Yeah, sure. So the craziest story that I have is when I worked as chief marketing officer at React and Share, we were having such a hard time getting through to these government bodies because at the time it was the pandemic. Everyone had moved away from their um, offices and they were working from home and we could not figure out how to get through to them apart from their work emails. So with time, we had noticed that they were coming back in, but very slowly or working maybe one day a week from, for example, an NHS trust. So a communications manager at an NHS trust. And we had also learned from, from my research that I had done, I had understood that they had a very reserved personality. They weren't really active on social media, so we couldn't get them from LinkedIn. Also, they were allergic to salespeople, like the government space allergic to salespeople. So one of the things was that I implemented was let's do account based marketing, but let's create a box in which we can ship to these people that will include things that a comms person would use pens, papers, sweets, like treats and sweets in there, but also a amazing NHS report that we had created for them because I had led a interview series from the company where we had done weekly interviews, or I think maybe at, at least like maybe like t five to 10 interviews a week that I was conducting. And I had then compiled that into the findings that would be used as part of it. So it was a printed, amazing report that they could read in their own time to learn from other communications professionals. And the amount of meetings that we had off of this box, which was always sitting on their desk whenever they were back in the office, the one day a week that they were finally back in the office, it was there for them. It was amazing. It was so nice to see how they would share it or say thank you and really appreciate it and they were finally being appreciated and i guess this links really nicely to where we started off at the start of this conversation which was being bold and being courageous is is the way to play cut through I, no one else was sending them a box that was you know worth less than maybe 50 pounds because a government professional cannot accept gifts more than 50 pounds as part of the their like rules so for us it was a case of like now's not the time to play it safe let's really try and get in front of them let's show that we want to help but also we've done our research we have a report so it's not something that's just quick and you can quickly buy and put into a box but it's something that's thoughtful and meaningful so that ins that's inspiring mean, a lot of people are like really scared about direct mails thinking mm. that hey maybe that may not reach the right person or maybe i don't know how other other person will react react and, and another thing is it's also expensive right uh, i mean if you if you think in terms of cost per lead or cost per customer well nowadays actually it's probably way more cost efficient if you're competing on social ads and ppc ads and you mm. think about the, the actual value and the of the cac in order to get the person in it probably is much cheaper to do it by direct mail, even though the upfront cost is a lot. For us, I've seen the results that way. And yeah, it was it was just awesome to see. Pretty, pretty good. Thank you so much, Hath, for taking our time. I have one uh, suggestion. I mean, if you, if you can suggest somebody, who would you like to see um, next on the podcast? Like a person or a marketer which you'd love to learn from? Yeah, so I've been connected with this woman for years on Twitter, and I think she's absolutely awesome. And I would love to, I always want to hear more from her. April Dunford, who's written obviously awesome, absolute pioneer within the positioning space for product marketers. So I would love to see April Dunford here. You'd be surprised. She's she's booked a podcast with me two weeks from now. <laughs> oh, awesome. So, so, so I'll, send you a, I'll send you a recording uh, when Please. you're done. Please do. Alrighty, uh, thank you so much.